Excellent. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so today's webinar is on SMA outcomes, measuring what matters. We're really grateful to have Dr. Colleen O'Connell and Jeremy Slater here to discuss this topic. Um, they actually, I believe Dr. O'Connell, you presented last summer um, on SMA adult outcome measures. And since then there has been a publication um, on this topic. And through our research hotline, we have received questions and it's actually a really timely topic given that today we saw that um, CADIS has released its final recommendation around risk of plan. And so uh, talking about treatments and access and monitoring access to those treatments and rehabilitation for adults is, is an important topic and one that we're really grateful to have both of you here today to discuss. Dr. O'Connell is a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist at Dalhousie University. And we also have Jeremy Slater, who is an MD candidate. So I will pass it over to you all. I'll stop sharing and we will leave um, questions until the end, but feel free to use the Q&A or the chat options if you are thinking of any questions as you listen to today's webinar. All right. Always wants to do it on the opposite side. There we go. <laughs> so hopefully everybody can see one big slide now. Is that correct? Looks great. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, it's my pleasure to be here with you and really, really happy that uh, Jeremy Slater is here with me because he did a lot of this work himself as part of his research uh, activities in, in medical school. Um, so what we're going to present to you is uh, some of the work that's happened over the past couple of years, specifically around what are called outcome measures. And uh, we've called this uh, measuring what matters outcomes in, in spinal muscular atrophy. And we've actually uh, adopted now sort of the moniker SMART. So this is the SMA recommended toolkit of outcome measures. So what we're going to go over and we should be able to do this in the next 30 minutes or so and then leave lots of time for questions and uh, we'll just start very briefly introducing sma which i know all of you here listening already know lots about and can probably school us on this but uh just really to set the tone for why we looked at what why outcome measures are so important and why we chose to do some research around this We'll look, take you through how we developed a Canadian consensus, so all coming to agreement, what results we found, what we learned from that, and why it's so important, and what we're planning on doing next with, with the results of all this. So as you all know, spinal muscular atrophy uh, is a condition that affects about one out of every 10,000 or 11,000 people that are born. Uh, it's a genetic condition, and most people, over 90%, have uh, a problem with one of the genes called the SMN1 gene. And because of that, certain protein losses results in the nerves that tell our muscles what to do to degenerate. And as a result, people with this condition will experience progressive weakness and loss of muscle function. In the last number of years, again, I'm sure all of you know lots about this and, and probably can inform many of us, um, treatment options for people with SMA have been rapidly changing. And uh, where we had a condition before where often it was just supportive care, we are now looking at actual drug therapies that can make a significant difference for certain people uh, with different types of, of this disease. And so whenever we have a condition that we're following and that changes over time and that we treat either with a drug or with a therapy, we need to know what we're measuring. We need to be able to see what an individual stage, uh, stage they're at at one particular time. And then if we introduce a treatment, how the, their outcomes changes with that treatment and also how we can measure how the disease changes over time. So outcome measures are those types of 
measurements that we do on an individual that tell us about how the disease is changing over time. It's important that the changes that we're looking at are meaningful. They're meaningful not only to the, the, to the clinician or the therapist, but also the researcher, and most importantly, to the individual who is living with SMA themselves. By having good tools to measure, we're better able to understand the patterns of the disease and how the disease responds to different therapies. And that gives us a much better way of, of doing uh, very defined and, and um, specific types of research so that we can pick up on even tiny changes. It also makes it easier if we're all talking the same language to be using the same tools. One of the examples that I can give you about what, uh, of an outcome measure, and this is not specific to SMA, but for instance, blood pressure. Um, we, many people, I think all of you probably at some point have had the experience of having your blood pressure taken. And we give a number, 120 over 80. Well, that's an actual outcome measure. It, 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 it's a tool by taking the blood pressure and we have a number. And then if we treat you with the medication or we make a person go do exercise or cut out all the candy in their diet, we can measure your blood pressure again and see what difference has happened. And so that's essentially what we're trying to do is identify all those different outcomes that are important to measure and capture in people with spinal muscular atrophy. So I'm going to let Jeremy now take you through all the work that was done over the past couple of years to come up with this toolkit of measures. All right, thanks, Dr. O'Connell, for, for starting that. That was that was great. Um, so yeah, as, as Dr. O'Connell mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about the project itself. You know, what what did that look like? What did we do? And 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 how did that process unfold? And and to start, you know, we kind of need to know what a Delphi method is itself. And and really, what it is is it's sending surveys to a group of experts, uh, anonymous surveys. And then repeating that process with with what we've learned and, and letting them know, you know, these were the results. Let's do this again. And so that's what you can see with this figure is we've distributed a survey. We look at the results. We generate a report of the results, and then we modify our survey to learn a bit more. Until finally, we'll fi we'll repeat this process a couple times, and we'll get a recommendation or we'll get a consensus, which is what we're trying to do. So. Um, what we did as part of this project was we gathered a group of clinical experts, physicians, physiotherapists across Canada uh, to, to put this together. And so we had 10 clinics across Canada uh, contribute. All of them were a part of the CNDR, the Canadian Neurological Diseases Registry. And they're predominantly physiatrists, neurologists, and physiotherapists. In total, there was 17 experts uh, that had contributed to at least one stage, and as I mentioned, up from 10 different clinics. So uh, the next question that we wanted to sort of look at and answer is why did we need a consensus? And Dr. O'Connell kind of talked about this already and covered this fairly well, uh, but just briefly to go over it again, it's, it's to understand that the natural progression and treatment outcomes for people with SMA, how are things changing? Can we measure how things are changing? Uh, as well as assisting in our clinical decision making and be able to anticipate changes and how things are going. And of course, to, to advocate and support for SMA clinics. And, and ultimately the project, in, 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 to sum it up into one, one sentence, the reason why we wanted to do this project is so that we can use the right measure for the right patient at the right time. So this uh, little figure here is a bit busy, but hopefully it's it's helpful for you. Um, it's just a little bit of a roadmap of the process itself and what we took, what we actually did. So uh, the first row there is kind of what we did before we started the Delphi. It was collecting everything, as you can see an arrow there popping up perhaps behind the videos, but um, it's looking at what we did before we even started the Delphi because we needed to know what's available in the literature. What do the experts use? What are the, the physicians using already? And how can we understand that? And so we set out first to actually build that. 
And so the next slide will show us a bit more perfect. Uh, so we have 34 measures that were identified. These are uh, various tools and questionnaires and tasks and things along those lines that had already been studied in SMA or in neuromuscular disease. And we compiled them all into a, a big document that looks like this outcome table that you can see the figure. And we gathered a lot of different information about it. How good are these tools? How reliable are these tools? Are they available freely or do you need to pay for them and things like that? And what we found was the majority of them were motor tools, meaning walking or tasks or writing or eating, anything like that. Um, and six were lung function or pulmonary tech tools. So uh, how well can you breathe along those lines? And a couple example measures is the HFMSC or the Hammersmith Functional Motor Scale, which is we'll talk a bit more about later as well. The forced vital capacity, which is a lung measurement or the SMA FRS, which is ask, rating a number of different functional tasks. And so then moving on now into the actual Delphi itself uh, is the first round of the survey. And uh, we had 10 clinics participate in this round. And this is what the survey in, in some looked at. It was quite, quite, quite uh, simple. Just one question per measure, and we just asked physician, or we asked the, all of our experts to say, how useful is this measure, or in other words, the clinical utility of the measure, and what is the quality of the measure? How good is this measure in performing what we want it to do? And we asked them to rate it on a simple scale of one to five, very weak to very strong, and see what we found out. And the next slide shows us kind of the answers, and this is a very busy figure. We're not going to get into that too much. If, if we want to take a look at it later, there's, there's another thing there, but uh, this is the results of our first survey. And that big vertical black bar is that cutoff point that we established just to try to narrow things down. Go from 34 measures down to something a bit more manageable in our second round. And so the next slide shows us exactly, we were able to narrow things down at a cut point of uh, a, sc a score that's neither weak nor strong. Uh, and we were left with 21 outcomes to go into the second round. And so in the second round, we looked at things a little bit differently, but largely the same. We thought we said, you know, what, what can we change? What more information would be valuable? What would we like to know that we don't already know or that we'd like to know more about? And we had 10 clinics participate again. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that survey in the next slide. Um, and this is the major change is that in the initial first round, we just lumped everybody together. In the second round, we split it into three different functional classifications of people. So we have uh, the non-sitters or those who are unable to independently sit on their own. We had sitters or those who were able to sit unsupported for a minimum of three seconds. And we had walkers or those who were able to take at least five steps without assistance. And we split the survey into those three groups. And the survey itself looked at, again, you know, how useful is the measure, how good is the measure, but it then added how often are we using that measure, which is a little bit different, uh, but quite similar. And it's just to get, get an idea of what are clinics currently using. And that information is helpful because it lets us know what will be easier to implement. If we were to make a recommendation, what are people already doing? Would they need to shift resources to, to change? And this is what we found. And again, there's another big busy table, but we won't get into that too much, but that's looking at uh, all of the results of the survey, how often things are being used, how are they scored based on what population uh, and all of that sorts of things. And on the left, you can see um, what the experts used in making their decision and kind of the different uh, aspects uh, in, in their ratings. And so we use the same cutoffs uh, as we did in the first one, which was a, a score of neither weak nor strong. And this allowed us to cut things down from 21 to 19. But something that was a bit different was that second question that we asked, how often are these measures being used? And that, that allowed us to um, kind of change what we wanted to look at, or rather to use that information as we went into the last step of the Delphi. Um, and get a final consensus. And, and here we go. This is the last step of, along the way of the project itself is that the final 
a consensus meeting or a virtual conference. Of course, this was during COVID, so we couldn't meet in person. Um, we had 16 experts across Canada come together online and all discuss the results of round one, round two, what were they using, what did they think, uh, and to go from there on to a final uh, consensus. And this is what we found. So we have a final toolkit or the SMA recommended toolkit of eight measures included, and they're broken up into the non-sitters, the sitters, and then the walkers. And there's three different types of measures that were included. There's the respiratory measures, there's the motor measures, and there's some functional measures as well. And we had four optional measures that we included, and we included those for a variety of reasons. Um, but they looked like promising measures, or they were measures that were really good measures, but there was just something a little bit better. And so next, Dr. O'Connell is going to talk a bit more about uh, what we've learned from this project and where we're going next. Thanks very much, Jeremy. And, and, I, and um, I, I'm just going to pause on this slide for a second, because this slide here basically is the culmination of the entire uh, about a year's of work. And, and um, what it means for you as an individual living with SMA is that uh, depending on what, um, you know, where you fit in terms of your mobility right now, whether you are, are what we describe as someone who cannot sit without uh, assistance, or if you can sit but not stand, or if you are ambulatory, then these are the measures that we would aim for every clinic in Canada to do and perform with you on each of your visits. Um, we went forward, I'll show you here shortly, uh, to go further and make a recommendation on how frequently these should be done. But so for instance, if you're someone who is what we term a non-sitter on at least your annual visit to your uh, clinic, you would actually undergo the breathing tests for a force vital capacity and a peak cough flow. You would undergo the realm, the revised upper limb, as well as the CHOP test. And you would answer a questionnaire that looks at your functional rating scale by answering some questions. And so by, and so by having all of these standard tests now, it would mean that somebody in Vancouver versus somebody in Saskatchewan or somebody out in Newfoundland, all would be having the same measure. So we can kind of compare across the country uh, and learn more about how the disease progresses. Um, it also has allowed us as um, a national group to advocate for not having to do more than this. And so we've been able to counter, for instance, in some provinces, uh, recommendations that they want extra tests or more done or more frequently. So this has allowed us to have a national voice around advocacy for what needs to be examined and what doesn't. So I'm just gonna take you through a few of the main tests and many of you have probably already experienced these. So the breathing measures, there's two main tests both of which involve blowing as hard as you can into a little device that then measures the force of how your lungs can take and the volume that your lungs can take in and, and breathe out. So the vital capacity measures that volume of air that you're able to breathe in and then blow out. And your peak cough flow measures how strong your breathing muscles are able to exhale and cough out your air all at once. And then depending on uh, the, the, your clinic and what equipment they may have, we'd also collect some measures of your inspiratory pressure and your expiratory pressure. Now, for individuals who are non-sitters, you're going to be <laughs> subjected to a measure called the CHOP ATTEND. Now, it's a measure that was initially developed for infants and so babies, but it's been adapted now for adults by taking out a number of the tests. And so we evaluated uh, for a final score out of 52 instead of a larger number. But in general, it looks at 
uh, small changes that happen in motor function uh, for head and neck, your arms, shoulder, hips, trunk. And it looks like things like how you can hold, hold your head up, move from side to side and initiate even just some flickers of movement in, in arms or legs. Um, the next measure, and this one is, is the Hammersmith expanded one. And this is used in people who are both able to sit and in people who are able to stand and walk. And so this looks at a number again of what we call motor measures. So mobility, everything from sitting, rolling, standing, squatting, jumping, walking, stairs. And we score that and I uh, believe the score in the end is out of 66 or 67. So it, it takes a little bit of time to do these measures. All told, you could be expected by the time you do all these measures to spend just over an hour, probably even closer to an hour and a half doing these evaluations. And now another one that's done for both uh, non-sitters and sitters is called the revised upper limb module. And this looks mainly at tasks that you do with your arms and hands, things like picking things up, pushing things, holding things, lifting things. And then finally, just in individuals who are able to stand and walk, we do a couple of uh, measures that look at moving from sitting and standing, walking a distance, turning around and coming back. That's called the timed up and go, or you might hear it called the tug test or the six minute walk test, which is exactly what it sounds like. How far an individual can walk in six minutes. You're allowed to stop and take breaks, um, but th that's essentially uh, what those two tests are. The functional rating scale is not an actual test where you have to do anything, but where we ask a number of questions. And it's one area that, you know, I'm happy to discuss this one more when we have when we pause here shortly for discussion, but um, I'm not super happy with this measure because I think uh, it doesn't it misses a lot of things that I think are important to people and we'll explain what we're going to do about that just shortly here. So. As I mentioned, after we did this work and came up with the consensus on all the tools that we're going to use, we also realized that a number of provinces and a number of insurance companies are asking clinics to do all of these measures on individuals really quite frequently. And for people who might have started on a drug treatment, they might be asked to repeat these measures as, as soon as every 12 weeks. Now, I just told you it can take about an hour and a half to do these measures. Many of them need to be done by a trained and sometimes certified therapist, which is not always easy to get every 12 weeks. Um, and so nationally, uh, 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 we wrote in, uh, a consensus letter, and this was published as well, about our recommendations that they really only need to be done annually. And for an individual who might have started on a drug therapy, we recommend perhaps twice a year. Um, now, some provinces are requiring every four months. However, we've managed in the majority of provinces to get this changed and be closer to the twice a year. I think COVID might have helped a little bit with that, but I'd like to think that some of our advocacy and all of us having the, you know, the same arguments and having this national consensus would really help. And so this is really going to help us now in following uh, patients on a national level and with, with some of our data collection for consenting people. So and how, how, do our, how do our findings measure up? Well, we're pretty happy that a lot of what we came up with are also ones that they've used in other countries, such as in Europe. And a lot of big clinical drug trials have also been using some of the similar measures. And they also seem to be consistent with what some of the regulatory bodies, such as INIS, um, ha has made. And th these are the groups that make decisions about drugs that they're going to support. Um, the toolkit captures a lot of domains of function, arms, legs, mobility, as well as some of your functional tasks and respiratory tasks. But we also recognize that there's some measures that are emerging that might even be a little bit better. So we're not necessarily fixed only on these. And we'd like the, be, these to be revised and reviewed every couple of years in order to keep them up to date. 
we also recognized that um, we're, we're probably missing a little bit in terms of what's really important to individuals and families who are living with this condition. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that now just shortly. Um, so this is important because it does represent a first national consensus. Uh, it's laid the groundwork now for clinics to be able to advocate for resources that they need to be able to deliver these outcomes. And it also allows us all nationally to be kind of speaking the same language. So as I mentioned, we recognize that none of these measures are really ones that are coming from the heart and the soul and the lives lived of persons with SMA and their families. And so what we're working on right now, and Jeremy uh, was able to get another uh, research grant to help support him this whole past summer, and we're looking at what we call patient reported outcome measures. So these are not ones that the doctors and therapists, you know, make you do things like lift and push and pull. And, but these are ones that are taking into account what an individual who lives with the condition is reporting back to us that's important. Uh, now, some of these may be standardized measures, um, like quality of life measures and scales. But some of them may be more open-ended where we look at how do we capture things that are really important to you. Um, for example, uh, if you're about to embark on a certain therapy, be it a drug therapy or perhaps um, a new exercise or a new positioning device or a new piece of technology, um, what is it that you'd like to get out of this? And then how do we measure that? We don't have the answers to that right now. Um, some of you who, who might have had me as your physician, I might ask you to arbitrarily rank on a scale of zero to 10, where you're at right now and where do you want to be and uh, where's your end goal? Um, so we need to look at how do we measure and how do you develop measures that are really important for individuals. We're also looking at incorporating these smart tools into our national database and collecting these prospectively. And that helps us figure out um, you know, how these treatments might have been changing the landscape for people living with this disease. And as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're going to always look at these every couple of years, make sure we stay current. And we're considering uh, trying to take this consensus to an international level and seeing if we can't come up with a global consensus on those measures that are most important for people. So, that's, I said we'd be about 30 minutes, and I think we're pretty bang on yeah. on that. <laughs> and so I wanted to leave lots of time here for questions and um, open it up to, to the floor. And I don't know, Himira, if you want me to um, look at the chat or if you're going to. I'm happy to read the questions to you as I see some questions came in privately as sure. well. One question here is, and you might have addressed it, is whether the, the toolkit that you mentioned will start to apply in clinical trials, because what they're mentioning is they have been on clinical trials and some of these measures were not used. So do we expect to see that in the future? Um, that some of these are, in, so mo many of these that we have on this list right now are ones that are, are involved with current clinical trials. The one that that uh, there's there's a couple of measures. One that's that fits as one of the um, patient reported outcome measures that's been used in some of the European clinical trials, is one that we're looking at in in this next stage of trying to come with a consensus around the the patient reported outcome measures. Um, and then there's another motor one called the motor function measure that's been used in a number of clinical trials that we've included right now as one of our optional measures. And I see as well in, in the chat and the question, somebody asked if certain clinics can do more than this. And absolutely, uh, clinics can do more. This is kind of our minimum recommended, and, and we can't even say it's mandatory, but it's our minimum recommended uh, toolkit. For example, in our clinic, uh, and this might actually answer another uh, question or comment that has come up, um, we, we do recognize, and it's been brought up, that none of these measures really capture things like speech quality, 
swallowing function and communication uh, ability. So we've started testing here and Jeremy is going to do, uh, we've got, uh, we think we've gotten a, a grant uh, to, to further this research, but we're gonna look at a couple of measures uh, including maximum phonation time and uh, an S to Z ratio, which is another kind of speech one, as markers of what we call bulbar function. So that's your speech and swallowing functions. Um, I see uh, someone has asked you, in addition to these standard, are you also collecting information clinical such as weight, bone health, diet, sleep, pressure ulcers? And yet a lot of those are captured, I, clinic to clinic are captured um, just as part of the um, clinician's assessment with the patient. We ask those questions all the time. Some things might be captured in the Canadian Neurologic Diseases Registry, but not all of those things. For instance, I, I know we're not necessarily collecting or doing regular bone density measurements, but perhaps that's something that we do look at. Um, weight is captured and weight would be collected uh, on the Neurologic Disease Registry. Um, sleep quality, we ask it, we talk about it, but I don't think it's being captured right now in our national registry. Another question here is, as adults are on different uh, therapies and treatments most recently, um, has there been Canadian data comparing adults on the different therapies on these different outcome measures? Is there Canadian specific data? Um, there, there's Canadian, it, it's being collected right now through the Canadian Neurologic Diseases Registry. And initial um, data from that registry has been presented, uh, I think two years in a row now at, at the um, SMA conferences. And there's been posters on this as well and platforms presented at some of the national or international meetings. Not on every single one of these outcome measures, but um, more general information about the Canadian landscape on a whole, looking at you know, the numbers treated with the various therapeutic agents. Um, some of these, the drug therapies, for instance, have only just been approved in adults very recently. And so we don't even have a year yet of data uh, in, in many provinces, for instance. Um, Rizdaplam in adults, I think we had only at one, just recently we were up to about 48 in the country that were on treatment for Rizdaplam, for instance. And this all just started within this past year, really, because of the approvals timing. Uh, Nusinersen, I certainly there is more information in the pediatric population for sure. Um, but again, this, this today is all, um, and what we presented is about the adults. That's great. Another question is, are you recommending the ambulatory group complete both the six minute walk test and the tug test? And if so, what are the differences in these tests? Yeah, so the tug, yeah, so the answer is yes to completing both of those. So the six minute walk test is a test more of endurance. So it represents a little bit more of, of functional capacity for, it's more of a, um, like, you know, it gets, it gets your heart rate up and, and it, it measures your mobility, but also some of your, your cardiovascular respiratory capacity as well, depending on how long you can go and how, how far you can go in that six minute time. We debated back and forth about the two minute walk test because some individuals who cannot do six minutes, could we get away with the two minute? And we certainly did agree that in some clinics, for instance, they may not have the time to run patients through a six minute walk. And they you could, but our, our consensus was to go with the six minute walk. Um, and really as a representative of, of endurance and functional capacity, that endurance capacity. The tug test measures a few different things. So it, it's looking at moving from sitting to standing, your ability to navigate on turns. Um, and it's a test that's used across a, a large number of diagnostic groups. And so we have kind of normal values 
uh, based on age. And it, it's had lots of correlations that look at risk for falls. Um, it, it, it classifies as a gait quality and walking quality measure, as well as some of the motor uh, or physical functioning. So they, they do look at two different things. That's great. There's a comment, not necessarily a question, but it's around, and, and they want to know if you both have heard of this, um, stress around these outcome measures, stress and anticipation around, um, you know, appointments, visits related to these outcome measures, especially if it's tied to, tied to continuation of treatment or mm -hmm. care. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we, we've uh, tried to advocate uh, as best as we can particularly in the adults, that these tools for the most part weren't developed to pick up on the, you know, the small meaningful changes that an individual may experience uh, because of being on, on a treatment. Uh, these were originally developed to really look at, you know, progression of the disease over time and therefore not necessarily vital or imposed on every visit and uh, you know if an individual wanted to opt out and not do it that was fine but with medications now that are you know really quite expensive it's difficult to get away or having a, an argument back to the payers of these to say well no we can't do them they want to know that what they're paying for is making a difference. And so we, we know though, and this is where we've had to come back very strong with, with, with the data that in adults, we're not gonna be able to see a difference over a short period of time. So it doesn't make any sense to measure this every four months. Um, and we're strongly advocating that at least a year and the research coming out of Europe some of the natural history is even telling us you're not going to pick up on a little change even, even within a year is very difficult and you're looking more like a you know more like the one to two year period and that not making a gain is not necessarily what we're looking for we're looking for stabilization we're looking for someone not to lose or not to lose as quickly as they might have before treatment. And so that's one of the really important reasons why we're trying uh, to quite quickly come up with some of these patient reported outcome measures. So for instance, maybe I'm not able to capture with the Hammersmith how the treatment is helping you, but maybe on a measure where you had as a goal still being able to talk and carry on a conversation and swallow on your own so that you don't need a feeding tube. Well, those are really important things. And if I can demonstrate that we've succeeded in those, that should be something that's important and considered as well. So that's kind of why we want to really look at coming up with ways of measuring those other things that aren't captured by these. Excellent. That actually touched on another question that we received, which is, shouldn't um, stabilization uh, be as important as improvement on measures? Um, when we're talking about differences, sometimes staying the same is their uh, goal or outcome that they have. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, and like, I'm sorry, I, I can't see everybody who's on here, but I'm sure there's, you know, there are individuals who have lived with this disease for decades. And we know that it may be very difficult to regain um, function in a muscle that has, you know, lost its, its motor units and the muscle itself has become atrophied or too weak that even if the disease is stabilized, we're not going to see an improvement. So not having an improvement to me is not a failure of the therapy. We're trying to prevent this from getting worse. If someone improves, that is fantastic. That is, we are obviously hoping for that, but not having that improvement that we can pick up with some of these measures, in my opinion, in many clinicians' opinions, is it means that we, we need to be better at measuring 
uh, what really matters and how do we pick up on those smaller things or things that aren't being captured and be able to, and then it's up to us to be able to demonstrate that to the payer. So I do believe that stabilization is incredibly huge. This is a condition that is progressive. And if we're able to stabilize it, that's huge. Absolutely. Another question here is around, um, it was in relation to our conversation about anxiety or stress related to appointments, but whether there are tester to tester differences, does the individual who's performing this test or collecting these um, uh, metrics or measurements, can that influence the results and that cannot influence the lack of change or a dec or demonstrated decline? Um. I mean, you could say that about just about any measure out there, you know, if somebody, you know, might, you know, if you're taking a blood pressure and somebody is, is not as skilled as taking the blood pressure or is having a bad day and is frustrated, you know, it, it, everybody's human. Um, but, you know, I, it's important that, you know, the individual has, uh, you know, the confidence of their treatment team and the, and the therapists who are doing the majority of these tests are certified and receive extra training specifically around these measures. Um, individuals doing a peak cough flow and a forced vital capacity, you know, those are respiratory therapists that do those tests. Um, and they're done with standardized equipment and for the most part are usually done, we try to have them done when an individual is feeling rested, not when they're stressed. Uh, if they're fatigued and we don't think we're gonna get a good measure, well, maybe we have to reschedule. Maybe we have to split some of the measures up over the course of a couple of, of days. Um, for some individuals, I know here in, in New Brunswick, you know, we, we've gone to the person's house and done it at their home because um, it was just not, possible or the person might have experienced a lot of distress in trying to get them hours away from their home to a center for having these types of measures. We recognize that people are going to perform the best if they're rested, if they feel well and, and, and they're not uh, unduly fatigued or under duress or under stress while doing the measures. So it's really incumbent upon the clinic. And I, I'd have to say, you know, as, as you as individuals and family, if, if you feel like you, you, you weren't getting your fair shot or your, your best, um, best performance, then please talk with your, with, with, with your clinicians. That's great. Another comment that came, uh, in uh, the chat box is around uh, this conversation has reminded them with the advent of therapies and these different outcome measures um, to see a neurologist or a physiatrist as right now they thought there wasn't anything different in terms of SMA since they were diagnosed. So this just reunites uh, them to, to go in and, and seek a specialist and, and have some of these measures done, um, which is great. Mm -hmm. Another question is around advocating. You've used that term throughout today's webinar. And they're wondering how can they advocate for access to therapies and treatments? As an adult in their 40s, they currently uh, do not have access or would not likely be approved for access to any of the approved Health Canada approved therapies in Ontario. So how can they advocate for drug therapies or therapies access. in general? Drug therapy. For the drug therapies. Um, well, I guess the first step is working with the clinician, uh, your, your, your doctor, in terms of whether or not your doctor feels, based on the evidence for the different therapies, whether or not you qualify or meet um, what has been shown in the studies to be effective. Um, you know, I... I, I you know, we, we would love it if every drug was available for every patient, but at the same time, there are certain uh, types of the disease or certain stages which have just not been studied with a particular drug. So it becomes difficult to say, oh, you should have access to this particular therapy when in fact there's no research or studies done to support that. An example would be someone who does not have the 5Q form of SMA. 
I start at the beginning, I mentioned that 92% of people do have that particular type of, of, of problem with their genes. These drug therapies are very specifically targeting that particular genetic issue. And so if the individual does not have that, then there is no, the, those medications are not going to help because they're not addressing the right problem. Um, but that, that, so that would be one scenario where it would be difficult to advocate if in fact the drug is not intended for the type of disease that you have. Now, if the clinician feels that in fact, this is a drug that you do deserve and should have an opportunity to, to uh, have access to, or at least to try it, it really does come down to uh, working with your clinicians um, to advocate for access. I don't think there's any payer mm -hmm. that, it's going to approve a medication without having the support of, of the prescriber. So you need to have that first. Um, and then it's to write the advocacy letters to whoever the payer is, the insurance company, the, the provincial government would be the two. It doesn't hurt to contact uh, local MPs or MLAs. Um, you know, nationally, we're in an election year right now. We still, you know, the, the National Pharmacare program is still on the table. Um, the catastrophic drug program, this is what this should qualify under. Now's a really good time to talk to your MPs about this or your potential MPs. Um, it, you know, it's a shame that some people, I know initially when these drugs started becoming available, that families had to consider moving provinces in order to access the drug. And that really isn't equitable. And that really doesn't seem to me like what should be happening in Canada. And I think that is where it really can become a political issue. That's, that's excellent, that's very helpful. Um, another question here is whether the measures that you have outlined in the toolkit are used or recommended to be used for other neuromuscular disorders. So is this toolkit applicable to an adult affected by Duchenne? or myotonic or Charcot-Marie tooth, other neuromuscular disorders? Um, some of them, yes. Some of them, no. So the timed up and go, the six minute walk test, the, all the breathing measures, those are used across the board for uh, many different diagnostic groups. Um, adults, children uh, in, in many different conditions. Um, the Hammersmith and the CHOP and the Realm, I believe, Jeremy, you might be able to correct me from, these are all specifically developed around SMA. I believe it's, it's it, they have been used in a select few other diagnoses as well, uh, but predominantly neuromuscular disorders, mm -hmm. neuromuscular disease, and, and perhaps even more specific to, to SMA, yes. Yeah. And the SMA functional rating scale, obviously specific to SMA. Um, it, again, I've voiced my dissatisfaction with it. it, is very much modeled on the ALS functional rating scale, but the ALS one does include speech and swallowing functions, which um, the SMA one doesn't. So. This is great. Um, this is from a teen who uh, who's currently transitioning to adult or looking forward to transitioning to adult care. And it's wondering if any of the measures um, are normed based on age or the based on function. Um, are, are there certain data sets that would be by her age, so by 19? Jeremy, do you know that off the top of your head? I, I can speak to the breathing ones, the, which are very much age uh, categorized. It goes on uh, age and gender and, and uh, height and weight uh, for the normal values for uh, things like your peak cough flow and FVC. So they're all based on, you know, those measure your age and gender and the size would go into uh, the measure. 
Hammersmith, like this is a problem with Hammersmith as well as the CHOP. They were developed really for children and they've been adapted and used for adults, which is part of the reason why things like the, the motor function measure are emerging. And we're going to relook at that because there's things about these tests that are really not that friendly for adults. You know, when does an adult roll around other than when we're in bed and we don't crawl, but some of those measures will ask things like that. And that's why the CHOP has actually been modified for adults, but there's no, no, no age dimension for any of those other measures. That's excellent. I'm just going to scan the, the chat. I know some come through the main one and Q&A. I know in the Q&A, there was a question around some people on treatment have noticed increases in swallowing disabilities. And I know you did talk about looking into um, measuring or tracking bulbar, bulbar function as uh, part of outcome measures as mm -hmm. well. Any other questions? If not on that, note, I can go ahead and thank you both so much for a really informative uh, talk, one that really allowed a lot of good discussion. Thank you for taking the time to answer the different questions that came in. If there are any additional questions, I encourage uh, participants to email research at muscle.ca um, and we'd be happy to, to share them with you, Dr. O'Connell, Jeremy as well. Um, we'd also like to thank Roche and Biogen for supporting the Let's Talk NMD webinar series. And hopefully you'll be able to join us tomorrow for our uh, webinar on physiotherapy and SMA. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. O'Connell and Jeremy. I know it's later in your day, it's evening time, but thank you for your time and uh, for a great presentation.